Okay. And um, I just lost my picture of all of you. I did turn off my video um, because it's easier for me to concentrate on the training um, without that going. So, okay. Well, thank you for joining us for this um, breast pump training part two. My name is Bonnie Rano and um, I'll be the one uh, discussing um, breast pumps today. Um, as you know, we did do part one back in October um, and that's now posted. Uh, today, uh, well, actually this is what we did last time. Um, we actually covered most of the objectives last time. We wanted to be able to recognize the Hygieia pumps and have the demo. Uh, learn about the role of the breast pump coordinator, learn about where resources were that had to do with breast pumps, and how to actually use the four different reports that are available in TWIST. And so those things are all marked off. And uh, the last thing here is to describe the procedures specific to pumps in WIC. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. And a lot of the slides um, and much of the information in this section was borrowed with permission from uh, an amazing two-part breast pump training that was offered by Washington County WIC in 2020. And uh, the training was developed by uh, Jeanette Lopez and by Sonida Valdivia, um, who was the breastfeeding coordinator there at the time, but who now works at the state office. So um, you can, uh, enjoy a lot of the pictures and things that are included here uh, because of their hard work. So these are some of the things we're going to be talking about as time allows. And um, I guess the first point here is that breath pumps are not necessary to breastfeed. Um, and sometimes they can even interfere with breastfeeding. And so uh, we're going to talk about some of the reasons why a pump may be needed. Um, we're also going to be talking um, about when it is appropriate to loan a multi-user pump versus a single-user pump or a manual pump. WIC also has some specific um, exclusions um, that you cannot give pumps in these situations, so we'll talk about those. We're also going to talk about insurance pumps because you're seeing a lot more of those these days. Um, we'll talk about what's required in terms of the education that a participant receives when she gets a pump. And, um, and then we're gonna talk about the management of pumps. And so even though this is only one objective, there's a lot of things that are involved in the management of uh, particularly the multi-user breast pumps. And then we're gonna close with talking about um, some of the accessories that go with pumps, the flanges and pressure gauges and how to troubleshoot some problems and how to handle situations where, when a breast pump is not returned. So, okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, yes, it's true, pumps can interfere with breastfeeding. If they're introduced too early, perhaps, um, it may lead to uh, people not producing as much breast milk, um, and then relying on formula instead. Um, often moms are really uh, disheartened when they try to pump very early after delivery and find that they don't get much milk. So there might be just a little bit of milk in the bottom of the bottle. Um, sometimes you can barely see it because it's colostrum and it's sticky. So um, that can be very um, difficult for moms to see when they might be expecting that they're going to be able to get three or four ounces right from the beginning. So it's important um, for moms not to pump too soon. Um, if they do need to pump that they receive some education about what to expect. So um, sometimes if pumps aren't used correctly, they can cause discomfort, which then can lead to um, some, you know, nipple problems or things like that. Um, often if a pump is used and a, then you're introducing the baby to a bottle very quickly, then that can lead to some nipple confusion or a preference by the baby um, for the quicker flowing bottle as opposed to the breast. And sometimes it can really affect a mom's confidence too. However, we're here to talk about pumps. And so these are some of the reasons that a pump may be needed. 
One of the biggest reasons is to help manage milk production. And um, there sometimes can be mother baby separation for a whole um, bunch of different reasons, whether it's you know the mom's health or the, the baby's health or prematurity, all sorts of things. Um, pumps can be used to increase or decrease milk production. They're used to help relieve engorgement, which can happen for many women right at the beginning. Um, and um, also to help protect the nipple um, if it has been traumatized. Sometimes women just have a poor start to breastfeeding for whatever reason. They're, they're not able to get it going, um, maybe because of some medical issues or um, a cesarean or who knows. Um, but many times um, breastfeeding doesn't get off to a very good start. And so a pump can be very effective to help bring milk in. And sometimes there can be factors that pertain to the infant, like in this picture, there might be you know, trouble attaching or a preterm baby or having some sort of um, oral anomaly or illness. Another reason a pump might be needed was, is because of baby's feeding needs. And uh, perhaps there's separation and the baby's in the NICU, um, perhaps the mom has to return to work or school very quickly. Um, maybe she wants to build up a supply of some pumped milk for her freezer uh, to allow for continued breast milk feeding um, when she can't be with her baby. She may want to allow other people to feed the baby. Uh, and as the baby gets older, um, you know, breast milk can be used to mix with cereal or other solid foods um, when that process starts. Sometimes the reason a pump is needed is because of personal choice. A mom may be choosing to just exclusively pump rather than pumping or uh, feeding directly at the breast. And this could be related to past trauma in her life, or it may be for a reason that she may not want to disclose to you. But we certainly want to support all moms um, for, to give uh, breast milk to their babies. So, um, and a fourth reason might be to avoid infant exposure to something. Maybe the mom is going to have a procedure of some sort. Um, and so you're looking at the timing of the feedings or possibly pumping and dumping, um, depending on um, what the exposure is. Um, with alcohol is more or less timing the feedings so that um, the baby isn't affected with some medical procedures or certain medications or even recreational drugs, um, pumping and dumping uh, may be more appropriate. But in order to do that, uh, a pump makes that much easier. So that can be a you know, legitimate reason for wanting to use a pump. Another reason that's not talked about a whole lot is milk sharing. And we're not gonna get into this a whole lot um, today, I will attach um, this, there's a document listed at the bottom here that gives some information about um, donating breast milk. And, uh, and so I will attach that to the minutes when they go out so that you have um, that information. Um, this is a picture of some women working at the Northwest Mother's Milk Bank. Um, it's kind of cool. Okay, um, I guess going back to that, um, milk sharing, of course, can be formal um, milk sharing, like through the um, Mother's Milk Bank, um, or it can be the informal sharing of milk, where it's between uh, maybe a family member or a close friend or something like that. And there's then the very informal milk sharing, which is when people will buy uh, breast milk off the internet, for example. And so there are certainly dangers that are, are um, part of uh, milk sharing. And uh, that's something that, you know, as staff people, it's important to um, be aware. Um, we want moms to tell us if they're doing any kind of milk sharing. Uh, it might be an indicator that they're um, struggling with milk production themselves. And so that's why they're getting milk from a friend. Um, or it could be that they're wanting to um, 
you know, help another, it might be going the other direction where they're um, pumping extra milk so they can share with someone else. Um, anyway, we want our participants to be able to be open with us about what's going on. And so it's important to listen carefully um, to what their situation is and then provide information um, appropriate to their situation. Okay, so really the, the first thing when it comes to um, distributing breast pumps in WIC is to determine um, whether someone is eligible for a pump. And this is um, a, a diagram that shows you, um, and this is in the breast pump handbook, but it sort of outlines um, you know, how to decide what kind of pump to give a mom. And so we're gonna be going over some of those details here. So in terms of loaning a multi-user pump, Per policy, um, there needs to be a medical need. And so either the baby or the mom uh, has a, a need such as an illness or a surgery coming up or a procedure or a separation of some sort, or they may need the pump um, to help with uh, increasing milk production or decreasing milk production. Um, in some situations, it may be that there's been an infant loss, and so a pump can be useful for a, a parent who, uh, just for comfort reasons, um, wants to uh, gradually decrease her milk production. Um, we've talked about some of those other reasons, but um, there generally needs to be something affiliated with a condition or an illness, some sort of medical need uh, for the multi-user pumps. We are not using these pumps as much these days because of the remote environment. And we currently have uh, permission really to use uh, the single user pumps instead uh, to make it easier for tracking these multi-user pumps. Um, but in general, um, they're, you know, these, that's when these types of pumps were needed. If a baby was born prematurely, for example, um, it could, and a mom is pumping numerous times a day, um, maybe eight to 12 times of pumping sessions every day, the multi-user pump is able to handle that. It has a, a larger motor, uh, it is built to have a longer duration. Um, the single user pumps are basically developed for a couple of uses a day and they can last you know, a year or more. Um, the multi-user pumps, as you know, are real, um, they're very effective. We've had some of our Lactina pumps for 10 or 15 years or more, and they're still working. They're, they're just really good workhorses as far as pumps go. And so um, they can be very effective for helping moms with these medical issues. Single user pumps are typically for a longer term pumping need, but their person is generally only pumping a couple times a day, like if they're going to work or school. Um, WIC policies state that um, single user pumps can be given to parents who are exclusively breastfeeding. They're not receiving any formula from WIC and they're returning to work or school for more than 20 hours a week. Generally, it's more than nine feedings per week. And so this allows somebody else to feed their baby um, you know, while they're away. And um, pumps are you know, real common gifts these days for baby showers and insurance companies are giving pumps now. And a lot of moms just think of it as a necessary item, but if they really aren't away from their baby, direct breastfeeding is still the best. It, especially the first three to four weeks when a mom is building up her uh, milk production. So uh, there are some other things that have to do with single user pumps and when they can be given in WIC and those are outlined in policy. Um, moms who don't qualify for a single user pump um, can qualify for a manual pump. And manual pumps are great um, for um, short, an issue where perhaps a mom is having a plugged duck or she finds that she's kind of overproducing a little bit and wants to um, decrease um, or she wants to increase her milk production by pumping perhaps after she's done a feeding. 
And um, sometimes, you know, just for date night or just going away for the weekend or something like that, uh, a manual pump can be very effective for that. Some moms may work in a location where they don't have access to electricity. And so um, manual pumps can be given, um, even two can be given um, if she is committed and wanting to pump uh, even without electricity. Um, so manual pumps are also Bonnie? great. Yes. Uh, excuse me, we are having some questions coming up. Do you want to wait until the end of the presentation or would you like to hear them as they come? I think it'd be good to hear them as they come. All right, um, Kathleen has a question. Hi, um, yeah, so with the, if things ever get back to normal, it seems like now the, um, the single user pumps, they're, they're basically being used as multi-user pumps as well. Um, but if we ever get back to normal, um, are you saying we can't issue a single user pump to a mom whose goal is to fully breastfeed um, but she has to supplement with NeoSure? Or can we offer to have her pay for the NeoSure on her own in order to be able to issue that? Yeah, that, that actually is correct, although we'll probably be um, doing some modifications to, to our breast pump policies um, based on what we've experienced during this COVID time. Um, right now, um, there's, I, I guess I'm getting some feedback here. Um, there is, there's a lot of reason to, to see that um, single user pumps um, are able to bring in milk production um, really easily. Uh, they used to not be as good a quality as what we used to call the hospital grade pumps. Uh, now we call those uh, multi-user pumps. Um, the main difference between a multi-user pump and a single user pump is actually the durability of the pump. It not, it doesn't really, there's not a difference in terms of the effectiveness of the pump in terms of bringing in a mom's milk supply. And so because of that, we may be, um, getting away from our heavy use of um, multi-user pumps that we have uh, in the past, and we will begin relying on the single user pumps more. We've sort of seen through COVID that it's possible for many women to uh, receive a pump um, and a single user pump and still do fine, even when they're pumping multiple times per day. And so um, I, I foresee that we will be kind of updating our policies um, to account for that. Not sure if somebody needs to be muted. Yes, um, when, so, when so you ask a, when okay. you're asking, Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, if once you ask your question, if you can mute um, until you're ready to respond again, I think there's background noise and, um, for the person who's trying to speak, it can be distracting. Okay, so to, to get back to your answer, Kathleen, the way policy reads right now, um, a mom needs to be exclusively breastfeeding to qualify for a single user pump. And she has to be uh, separated basically from her baby. And so for a mom that um, would be using Neosure, she would qualify for a multi-user pump. And, uh, and so it's not that she won't qualify for a pump, it's the type of pump that she would qualify for. And so um, that's kind of the difference there. Did that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's just got confusing because now we're also using the single user pump as right. a multi-user, but it, it sounds like that, that may be the future going forward. So um, it's yeah. good to know that we're going to have all of our mom's bases covered. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. Yes. Uh, and Bonnie, Christine has a question. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Bonnie. Um, Hi, I Christine. just wanted to uh, check in. In a previous, a couple previous slides there, you had mentioned that moms can choose to pump for various reasons, right? And so um, one being a previous trauma. Now, um, if a mom cannot get access to a breast pump through her insurance, it's rare, but it's still happening. Um, 
that would exclude her based on the eligibility criteria that's listed in the policy. She would be excluded from being able to receive a pump. Now, I know we can make some exceptions, but I don't, you know, I wonder if that's something that we should add to the policy to be more trauma informed and inclusive for these kinds of situations. Christine, I think that's a great point. And you're right. Te technically, she would not qualify for a pump, although um, it would fit into one of those exceptions that we make when we have we ask staff to call us if they have a situation where they feel like a single user pump uh, would be you know, helpful for a mom to continue breastfeeding. And so we do make exceptions. Um, and so, um, but it would be better to have that in writing so that that's clear for everybody. And I will take note of that um, because uh, I, I actually went to a, or listened to a webinar not too long ago and they were saying that uh, WIC is too hard nosed about how and when we give out pumps. And uh, particularly for moms who want to um, be exclusive pumpers. And so um, I do think we need to update our policy in that regard as well. So in terms of federal policy, um, we don't, uh, pumping is something that is not a required service for WIC. And so we are not given a lot of directives around pumps from the the federal program. Uh, these are more state policies that we have set. Um, and a lot of them were set a long time ago. So um, there is definitely room to update and improve um, how we work with moms around pumping. Thank you for that, Kathleen. Karina, are there other questions? No, that, that looks like it for right now, okay. Bonnie. Thank you for your questions and your comments. Keep them going. Yeah, thank you for helping me with the chat too. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, some of the exclusions that are in WIC right now is that we cannot give a pump to a woman who is still pregnant. She hasn't given birth yet. Uh, I know that many of the insurance companies look at this differently and are willing to give pumps to women um, before they deliver, but that's something that we are not able to do in WIC at this point. Um, we can't give them a pump as sort of an, an inducement to continue breastfeeding, kind of as a reward. Um, we can't give pumps to women who are beyond one year postpartum, um, and uh, we can't you know, there are specific criteria, like I said, that are, are in the policy and in the handbook. And so parents who don't meet that criteria then wouldn't qualify for a pump uh, unless there was an exception made and you would contact, you know, state um, breastfeeding uh, coordinators or myself and um, explain the situation and kind of why you're uh, recommending that she receive a pump. If a mom borrowed a pump um, and didn't return the pump, um, then she would be excluded from um, borrowing another pump. And um, there are situations where moms um, are using products that are contraindicated for breastfeeding. And so these situations are a little trickier and um, uh, participants who um, are using marijuana, for example, um, they would need to be, have a very thorough assessment done to determine whether um, loaning or uh, giving them a pump or loaning them a pump would be in their best interest. Um, it's kind of a, a risk benefit um, evaluation that goes on for moms and how involved they are with the medical community and things like that. So generally a health professional needs to assess that situation. And um, there again can be times when a pump might be appropriate. So, but in general, um, pumps would be excluded for moms uh, that are using contraindicated substances. Insurance pumps. Um, it's just been um, with the Affordable Care Act going into effect in 2010, it took about five or six years before our Oregon health plan began uh, providing pumps for moms. And there still are a few um, CCOs out there that still are not following uh, policies uh, for providing pumps to moms. But um, it is important because OHP is another um, government program. It's important um, that we ask 
uh, parents to check with their insurer first um, before getting a pump from WIC. However, we don't want that to be a barrier for her to continue breastfeeding. And so um, our use of pumps and WIC has really gone down a lot in the last few years because of OHP now providing pumps in most areas of the state. Um, they are considered uh, the first provider of pumps. And um, so WIC is considered the second provider. Because they're both government programs, we can't have both programs providing the same woman a pump. That's considered double dipping. So participants should first ask their insurer for a pump. Um, and it really is great if they can explain this to their physician prenatally that they are interested in breastfeeding or that they're planning to breastfeed, that they would like to have a pump. Um, some CCOs have a few hoops that moms have to jump through to get their pump. Uh, mostly like a doctor's recommendation, for example. Others, it's more a, a matter of just asking. Some moms are given a choice. Um, you know, they're giving a list of pumps and just asked to select one from the list for the ones that they want. Um, and so participants may need some assistance in being able to, to select a good quality pump. They may know nothing about pumps. <laughs> and so they're just names on a, on a sheet of paper and they don't know which ones are you know, more effective than others. And that's why um, the guidance they get from you can be really helpful. Um, you can provide opinions if you're asked, as long as you let them know it's just your opinion. Um, the selection of course is up to the participant, but sometimes they're just choosing a pump based on what somebody else has told them or a picture in a brochure or something like that. So, um, and then they often mailed the pump. Um, and so they are given no instruction on how to use the pump or when to use the pump. And so they may come to you um, for some help with how to use the pump they receive from their insurance company. And again, it, it's perfectly fine for you to offer that help um, to guide them to any directions that are online um, or to, if you don't know personally about how the pump works, to um, be able to, you know, help them by giving them another name of someone who, who can guide them in that process. And then participants who can't get a pump through their insurance can receive a WIC pump if the criteria is met. Um, or if a pump that they get through insurance stops working, um, We've had a lot of stories where they've gotten a pump that's not very effective and it breaks early on. Um, and so if they bring their broken pump from the insurance company back into you, you can offer them a WIC pump, again, provided that they meet the criteria. It can be substituted out. So that has been happening in, in some areas too. Some of the brands um, that I would consider fairly good quality for a single user electric breast pump are listed on this slide. Um, I put Hygieia at the top now that we're gonna be working with them, but Medela also has good products. The Amida um, has kind of revised many of their products um, and they have one now called the Maya Joy. I think it's even Maya Joy Plus is the one that is the best. Um, Spectra has a pump that's pretty popular. Um, I've heard mixed reviews about that one, but um, when we tested the Spectra um, back when I was working on a, a breast pump contract, we tested all of these pumps and the, they came through pretty well. The Ardo pumps and the Lansano pumps were pretty good. Uh, it's really been an expanding market ever since the Affordable Care Act um, you know, put the law into place that pumps needed to be a covered service for women. And so a lot of new companies are out there. A lot of foreign companies are trying to jump in. And um, it can be very difficult for a participant to evaluate um, and for staff members to really know to evaluate which pumps are good ones or not. Uh, unfortunately, there are some pumps out there that um, are not very effective. And what happens is a mom begins using that kind of pump and if it uh, if she's not getting good milk production, she doesn't tend to blame the pump. She tends to blame herself. And um, we really want to avoid that happening. Um, so this is a list that you can perhaps um, copy and or um, if, if this 
one of these types of pumps is on their list of pumps to choose from, you can encourage them to go this direction because these have been tested. And uh, it's a place to start uh, anyway. Yeah. Bonnie, so Shannon has a question. Okay. Or comment. And ahead, Shannon. Someone else had the same question too, but so I had not heard, because I have had situations where their pump that they got from OHP broke. Um, but I had not heard about the part where we're supposed to collect their broken pump. What do you suggest we do with their broken pump? Just throw it away? Yeah, yeah. You just need to dispose of it. That's all. Or, okay. or even just look at it. You can test it if you want. You yeah. can use your... Because um, maybe they didn't, they just weren't using it correctly or something. That, like that. There certainly are um, situations like that. Um, somebody wrote to me recently about that where um, they hadn't assembled the pump correctly. And so... That then once they realized what, what was going on, they were able to continue with the pump they started with. So um, sometimes you can test a pump, you know, to see if it does give adequate pressure or not. Sometimes things just break. Some of the pumps, you know, just have plastic parts that just snap or, or parts, you know, get lost and so they can't use the pump. Um, and in that situation, you, you basically just need to be able to see the pump so that you know that they're not you know, keeping one pump and selling another pump or whatever. Um, yeah, our moms not, aren't really doing that, but uh, that I think is the concern um, in terms of uh, the double dipping aspect of government programs. So, yeah. Okay, thank you for your explanation. Sure. Okay, when a participant receives a pump from WIC, um, there is some very specific education that needs to be provided. And um, there's a number of steps here that we're gonna go through. Uh, it's not just a matter of handing them a pump and telling them to watch the DVD or go online and watch how to assemble it. Um, it's even in this remote environment when a pump is given out, um, it's important that you call the mom once she has the pump in front of her and walk her through how to assemble the pump and how to use the pump. So um, generally, if, if it's an in-person appointment, you'll want to check to make sure all the parts of the breast pump are there. Um, you'll want to demonstrate how to assemble the pump and take the pump apart and have her uh, reassemble it. Um, and this you really can't do very easily in a remote environment, um, but uh, you can kind of walk her through the steps of assembly. Uh, then you review with her how to use the pump for, for pumping breast milk. It might be that you need to give her some written instructions or refer her to a, D, a DVD or YouTube link or something like that. Um, and then um, you want to provide information on how to store breast milk safely. And um, we do have guidelines. Um, they're on our website. These are the WIC guidelines for um, storing breast milk. And there's, you know, whether it's been out on the countertop or in the refrigerator or in a freezer um, with a separate door or a deep freezer, there's some differing uh, recommendations, but um, you can make moms also aware that there's a lot of different recommendations when it comes to storing breast milk safely. Um, some daycare recommendations are going to be a lot stricter. Um, other guidelines they find online um, might be a lot looser. And so, but these are the ones that we are required to use in WIC. And so uh, it's generally about I like to use the role of the rule of fives. Um, it's generally about five hours on the counter, five days in the refrigerator, or five months in the freezer. Although actually, depending on the freezer, it can be a lot longer than, than five months, but that's an easy way to remember it. Um, we also want to help them develop a plan for pumping. Sometimes they feel like they need to pump when they could be directly breastfeeding. And so it's important to talk about how frequently they're going to be pumping, whether it's just for a short time to build supply or whether it's more of a long-term thing, like where are they going to be pumping? Is it going to be at work or at home? Um, many moms have no idea how long they're supposed to pump. Um, 
and um, or be like switching between breasts and that kind of thing. You can help walk her through a lot of those questions that she might have about the how to of pumping. And then it's important to remind her about keeping the pump clean. Um, many moms really, you know, again, this is a brand new activity for them. So they don't know what they're supposed to do. It generally is fine for a couple feedings during the day to not wash all the parts um, and then bring them home at the end of the workday and then do the washing then. Um, but it is a good idea to have moms um, practice when they disassemble the pump to actually run the pump for a couple minutes with just the tubing attached because that can help air circulate through those tubes um, and uh, that can prevent the growth of molds. Um, they don't need to be washing the tubing. It, milk shouldn't be getting into the tubing to begin with, but, but uh, if, you know, just making sure that air gets through there, it helps dry it out at least from any condensation that was in there. So that's a, a, a guidance that can, can be really helpful for moms. We also have written material in, at the state office um, that you can order for your agency. Uh, we have a, a nice brochure on hand expression. We have a handout that's just a tear sheet on pumping tips. And then we have our um, breastfeeding employee rights card and our um, breastfeeding in public uh, information. And so those are available to you, some of the material that's there. Um, we do encourage continued breastfeeding directly um, because it's, it's easy for moms to just, if they have milk in the freezer, to just use that and then yet they're ending up missing out on, um, you know, putting that order in uh, to uh, continue producing enough milk um, for the baby. So some moms will kind of go through that freezer milk pretty quick and then realize that their supply has really dropped down because they haven't been feeding um, their baby directly at the breast as much. So if there are problems with the pump, um, it's important that moms are given, you know, a name for who to contact, um, what to do, um, you know, how to exchange the pump or someone to ask their questions to or things like that. So um, providing that name is critical as well. Um, many moms, um, you know, there's two sizes of flanges that come with the pumps and um, but moms come in a lot more than two sizes. And so it's important that the flange um, fits the woman. And so it may be that she gets the breast pump home and she looks at it and she calls you back and says that, um, you know, it's not comfortable at all. And so a flange, the nipple should be centered in the flange tunnel. Uh, it shouldn't be touching the sides um, because that can rub. Uh, if the nipple is just swimming in the tunnel, um, it's not uh, fitting well enough to get a good, uh, to get good suction to be able to um, empty the breast. And so um, this diagram here shows, um, you know, when the uh, flange is too small or too big or kind of what the correct fit is. And this type of information is uh, available online as well. Some agencies actually have the little plastic, um, it, it's like a little plastic tube that, um, or kind of a flat piece that has holes in it that kind of helps a uh, mom um, get measured, so to speak, for her nipple size. But something that's important to realize is that moms may have two different size of nipples on her her body, you know, one breast may be one size and the other breast might be something else. Or at the beginning, when a mom first starts breastfeeding, often her nipples are larger, this little bit of inflammation perhaps at the beginning. Um, but as the body adapts to breastfeeding, um, there's some, there can be some size changes, not only in the breast, but also in the nipple. And so she may want to use one size of flange for the first month or so, but then find that an, a smaller flange size works better as time goes on. And so, um, Again, I think as staff members, you just want to be aware that flanges come in a lot of sizes. We can order them in a lot of sizes for you to keep on hand. If a, the two that she's given in her pump really aren't working, ask her to come back in and you can exchange for, um, well, not even exchange, but um, give her a flange size that would be more appropriate for her. So that is available. Yes. 
Bonnie, we have a question from um, a, a participant. Did we ever get an answer back if the Hygieia pumps will have flanges smaller than um, 24 millimeters available? Yeah, the Hygieia pumps, the smallest that they come in is the 24, but the Medela flanges do fit the Hygieia pumps. Um, and, um, and, and they also will be, um, they're hoping to be able to offer even smaller ones, um, but at this time on our order form, um, we aren't able to get any lower than the 24. Uh, they're working on a piece that might be an insert that, that could help. Um, but yeah, I'll, if I learn more, I will uh, let you know. Um, I did make Tom aware that we do have, um, we do have a lot of women who uh, really prefer the 21 millimeters. Um, and so uh, we need a way to be able to meet that need. So, you know, actually with the Evolve, I'm not positive that the Medela flanges are gonna work. Um, I will need to double check. I know that it works with the Endear. That's the pump I'm more familiar with, like our Lactina, but um, I'll need to double check on the, the Medela flanges for the Evolve pump because their flanges are slightly different. Um, and Medela has changed their flanges now too. <laughs> so they're a uh, slightly different shape, more oval now. Okay, good question though, uh, Megan. I'll try to uh, get back to you on that. Okay, we're getting down to more of the management piece now, what to do um, when a multi-user pump is loaned out and then it comes back in. And so what to do when, and so this is kind of some quick slides to show you in pictures. Um, so this, they're turning the pump back in after it's been used. The first thing you're gonna do is to visually check the condition of the pump and the case. You open it up and just take a gander there, look at it. Then you document that the return, the pump has been returned and you would document it in the twist record there where you can see the date returned. And you would also document it at the bottom of the loan agreement. And there's a spot on the loan agreement where you can say what type of condition the pump was returned in. And uh, so those are the two places that need to be documented. You can also um, offer to copy the updated loan agreement and give it to the participant if they want you know, to have proof that they returned the pump. Um, some, um, particularly with our uh, hospitals, but um, there have been some sloppiness in terms of um, pump returns, you know, they're coming at a busy time or it gets set aside or a form doesn't get signed or just things have happened. And so we have had situations where participants have said they've returned a pump, but we haven't had record of it in the WIC office. And so uh, it becomes a situation where, uh, you know, we don't know what to think or believe uh, at the state office. And so we end up usually marking those pumps unrecoverable. So the more diligence that you can use uh, when a pump is returned, the better. Uh, so that moms know and the dates and are on the form and updated in twist. Then um, mom walks away, you leave the pump in its case. Uh, you might've opened it just to take a peek, but um, basically you keep the pump in its case and you put it in a plastic bag right away. That's one of the first steps you do. Then you secure the top of the bag with a twist tie of some sort so that um, it's you know, nothing can get in and nothing can get out. <laughs> what we're checking for here is insect infestation of the pump. This tends to happen more in Southern parts of the United States. We have had less problems here, but it does happen. So then it's um, the pump is in the bag. It stays in the bag for three days. You label the pump with the number so you don't have to open it up to see what number it is, um, the date it came back in, and then the date that it can be removed from the bag and uh, be cleaned. So um, Washington County took this picture. They have a nice little ready-made label uh, that can be put on the pumps and filled out. 
Um, and there's actually our kind of wash, washable label so that it, you can, you know, remove the writing and use that label again. But it doesn't matter whether you have a fancy label or not. It's just easiest if you can record on the on the bag or on a piece of paper attached to the bag, um, the serial number, the date received, and the date it can come out of the bag. Then after three days, you would take the pump out of the bag and you'd visually inspect it again to see if there's been any evidence of insect or rodent infestation um, or any other kind of damage. Sometimes they smell like smoke or sometimes um, it just doesn't look quite right or parts may be broken off. There, there's just reasons to be, to, you know, to kind of really check the pump over. Um, if there's no problems in terms of infestation, then you would proceed to cleaning the pump. And one of the first things you do is you spray the front and the back air vents with compressed air. And these cleaning instructions are also available um, online on our same um, breastfeeding page under the pump uh, section. Then you clean the pump and the pump case. Sometimes the case gets forgotten. Uh, with a disinfectant cleaner of some sort. Some people will use a spray and then use paper towels or a cloth to clean them. Some agencies will use these cloths that are um, already um, you know, moist with the disinfectant cleaner. Um, but generally, um, it takes more than just wiping them down with a cloth. You may need to get out a toothbrush or some other little tool to be able to get in many of the nooks and crannies. Um, and you can do that with um, rubbing alcohol uh, to help get something clean. And you'll notice in these pictures that you do uh, put on a pair of gloves before you clean pumps. That's wise. And then after the pump has been cleaned, you wanna test it for performance. You wanna test the suction using a pressure gauge. And so this would be a task that happens every time in between when a pump is returned and when it's loaned out again. Um, it's just a routine um, you know, behavior that, that, that you do between pumps to make sure that it's safe and working for the next mom. And so we do have uh, two different kinds of uh, multi-user pumps right now. And so we also have two um, types of gauges to be used. Um, then once the pump is cleaned, uh, you, um, their agency puts it in a clean plastic bag and stores it away from any other dirty pumps. Um, actually, that's not written in the instructions that you have to put it in a bag. I think that's best practice. But um, many agencies have an area of their office where they can put the clean pumps and, um, and they're, they're fine there um, they're in a closet or something like that but bagging is a great idea too. You just wanna make sure you know which bagged pumps are the clean ones and which ones are the ones that have not been sanitized yet. So when we talk about pressure gauge, um, this is the instrument that is used. And um, we encourage agencies to kind of set aside one set of flanges to use just all the time when they're testing pumps. And, uh, I think I have a picture coming up um, of the other gauge, but um, basically what the gauge does is it evaluates the vacuum pressure um, so that we know that the suction that the pump is performing is within certain range um, so that it's effective for actually removing milk uh, from the breast. Pumps that are not working as well, where the suction is not as high, they're not gonna be effective. And so um, that can be very discouraging for a mom. Uh, when pumps get to the point, uh, particularly some of our older lactinas, they're getting to the point where they really aren't maintaining pressure anymore and they can't be fixed. Um, and so uh, at that point in time, that would, would be when you would retire that pump. Um, you would you know, take it out of service and perhaps save the case or a knob or clips from the case or something like that, maybe the strap, and then you would discard the rest of the pump. These are the instructions, um, which are online for either using the Hygieia or the Medela gauges. Um, 
kind of the process. So I encourage you to wherever you clean pumps to maybe have this guidance um, available. So particularly newer staff can kind of look through and understand the process of testing a pump. Okay, so then uh, one of the next things that, you know, you would do um, if a mom comes in and she says she just can't get this pump working right, um, that you would want to troubleshoot any issues that are going on. And um, there is a troubleshooting guide that's on the website that can help with some things. Um, some things you learn kind of with practice. Um, but we're just gonna go through a couple of troubleshooting things here so that you can tell um, you know, what is kind of happening. I think I might've missed a slide here. Okay, so one of the first things is to make sure the pump is plugged in right. Um, the, the little teeth that go into the electrical outlet can sometimes get, I don't know, they get looser somehow and so they, maybe aren't staying in the outlet as well. Um, or perhaps the valve hasn't been fitted correctly to the flange. Um, or maybe the membranes, the membrane's a little white piece uh, with the bumps on it. Um, maybe it's not clean or maybe it's not, um, you know, it's bending or it's torn in some way. It's amazing that a little white membrane with a slight tear in it can, can basically make the pump not work correctly. And we have, you know, most agencies have the extra um, membranes that are available that they can use. We also have stories where dogs will eat these membranes up. Um, and so moms need replacements. So those are some easy things to check right away just to see if the pump is not working because of something like that. Um, the lactina and the endear parts are interchangeable to an extent. And so, um, you basically need to keep the uh, hygiene, the, the endear tubing with the endear parts and the lactina tubing with the lactina, but um, either one can go on the pump. It's the end of the tubing that is actually the, the issue because of the way that they connect. And so um, that's, that's the main key there is to make sure you've got the, the tubing that goes correctly uh, with the pump. Sometimes the piston might not be in the correct position. And so uh, when you first put in, you want to lift the arm of the pump up, put the piston in and then move the arm back down. Um, and so this one with the little uh, half, you know, the thumbs up signal shows that the piston is straight. It's um, been inserted correctly. This one, you can see that the piston has actually been put in, but it's kind of jammed in more of an up, it's going up instead of going across. Um, what we call the regulator ring, that's this white part here, and that determines how, whether you're at maximum pressure or minimum pressure, um, that you know, is a, you know, changeable by moving that around. And if the white regulator adapter is not you know, in place here, that can make a difference on the pump working needs to be kind of all the way up um, there. So visually you can often see uh, that maybe the reason the pump isn't working is because something like that has happened. Or perhaps it's not been inserted, you know, the handle part hasn't been inserted correctly. It has to go pretty deep. Um, you can see a, quite a bit of white here sticking up um, for that to be in place. This one is just not pushed down as much as it needs to be. Well, let's see what happened there. Okay, so what to do when a pump is not um, returned. These are some of the steps for tracking multi-user pumps. 
uh, I came in and I took out one of the things today based on what I shared with you earlier about us changing our procedure. So basically when a mom um, does not return her pump by the due date, then you would call her. That's the first step. You would wanna call her within that first seven days of her not returning the pump, ask her, you know, what's going on. Perhaps she needs an extension. Um, perhaps she's not pumping anymore and it's just out of sight, out of mind. Um, but you wanna call her to, to find out what has happened with the pump. And then um, you would also send a letter so that she's receiving something in writing stating that the pump is overdue and that it needs to be returned within the next 30 days. Then um, 30 days goes by and she hasn't returned the pump. That's when you would refer it to the state agency. And um, on the breast pump issue screen in Twist, there's a little box that you would click it says referred to state. There's a place for you to enter the date where you would refer it to the state. And um, that's more or less for your agency to know what's happening with that pump. That box referred to state does not notify us in any way through twist that a pump is overdue. So the second step is to email us, let us know that a pump is overdue. Um, and you email us a copy of the loan agreement and a copy of the letter that you had sent and then we take both of those things, the, the letter and a copy of the loan agreement, which shows that the, she has signed it, that she's agreed to return the pump or pay for the pump right on that loan agreement. Um, once we have those, then we can compose a letter to send to her, um, which basically states that she needs to return the pump to her local agency. Um, or contact us um, if there are extenuating circumstances regarding the pump. And, um, and then if she's, we also put a bill in the pump for, um, right now I believe it's like $308 or something is what the cost of our pumps is. Um, and so that often gets a participant's attention that they need to you know pay for the pump if they don't return it. And so, that often getting that letter is one of the, the most useful things to spur a mom on to not put off this task of getting the pump back to the local agency. So um, just so you know, when, um, when we send that letter, um, we don't always hear back or if, if we uh, get the mail returned because the person has moved on to a different address, then we generally will make that pump uh, status in twist will change it to something called unrecoverable. Uh, and that way it doesn't, you know, it doesn't stay red um, as an overdue pump where staff then keep asking uh, about it. Of course, in that situation, I just said they had moved away. But um, basically, we, we try to follow up on these pumps um, to, to get them back. Um, we don't always succeed. And so at that point, we would either uh, make the pump unrecoverable. It's very, very rare that we collect on these pumps. We cannot remove a mom from, from WIC um, based on whether she returns the pump or not. So we don't have a lot of teeth, but we do want to try to get these um, pumps back because they are expensive. And, um, and we want to be able to have other participants use them. So, um, there are reasons to try to track these pumps. I know many staff members have told me that, well, they keep saying they're gonna bring it back. And so we give them the benefit of the doubt and we don't refer it to the state. You know, we give them another month to try to get it in. And, but the longer that it goes from the time that it was due till the time that we learn about it is um, it just gets a lot harder than to collect that pump. So um, as much as you can, try to uh, stick to the time frame um, because you're more apt to get that pump back. Um, you know, pumps that aren't being used get put in a closet or put in the garage or, you know, just, you know, it's not that a participant necessarily means to keep them, but um, again, it's just, she's busy and uh, it just gets put off. So, Okay, and the step that I removed from here is the one that we talked about where you don't have to change the issuance date anymore from three months down to one month. You could just keep it at three months. But do continue to remind them um, you know, gently and appropriately that the pump is overdue, that you're still waiting for the pump to be returned. 
um, and that you would need to refer it to the state office if they don't get it in. And the state office, you can even say, would be billing them for the pump. Um, so it's not meant to be hard-nosed, it's just a matter of kind of keeping track of these things. Okay, so in terms of management, uh, we ended up talking about kind of when to loan a pump and what kind of pump to loan, what some of the exclusions are in WIC, uh, insurance companies and pumps, um, the specific pump education um, that's required for uh, participants, um, and then how to, how to clean pumps, how to test the pressure, how a little bit of information on flanges and troubleshooting. Um, we didn't cover everything, of course, but at least it gave you a taste of some of the things um, that happen when it comes to pumps. Are there any questions or comments um, about any Looks of these steps? Like Shannon has a question. Okay. I just wanted to say, um, when someone asked about the smaller flange sizes for the Hygieia, I found that these these are from Hygieia and they're the soft silicone ones that you can insert. And they're pretty small. So okay. if you insert one of these in a 24, I haven't measured it, but I'm guessing it's at like a 21 or smaller maybe at that point. Um, so that might be a good solution. Yeah, and you got that from Hygieia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he did talk about an insert of some sort, but I didn't know if that was for one of the bigger ones or not. Yeah, no, it's called soft silicone flange single, and there's 20 in this bag. And I ordered it on the last order. Okay, great, Shannon. Thank you for that tip. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Now's the time. Did I overwhelm you <laughs> with information? Bonnie, while people are pondering their questions or comments, um, I just wanted to remind the person who's calling in with a phone number that ends in 766, if you can contact Diane Arnold, Karina Me, or Bonnie to let us know who you are so we can make sure you get uh, counted as attending the meeting, that would be great. Good. Well, I'll also, um, questions uh, may come up later, you know, as you're looking at your pump supply or, you know, a lot of things we didn't cover can come up as questions as well. So feel free, anytime you are concerned about a situation or a pump, um, please call us, keep us informed as to what you're dealing with. And um, we can be more of use to you when we know what your, you know, questions or problems are. So I know that tracking pumps can be a lot of work. Um, and uh, I, we really appreciate all the efforts that you make to try to track pumps. Um, some of you may end up deciding that it's really not worth it to, to be using the multi-user pumps long-term. Um, you know, there'll be more to come on that. Um, other agencies may not want to give up multi-user pumps altogether. So, um, you know, as our policies evolve, as we these new products come in, and as our you know with our remote environment, there's just a lot of things that are changing right now, and um, questions are bound to come up. So do feel free to reach out to me, or you can reach out to uh, Karina or Kelly, who are the breastfeeding coordinators. So, um, Bonnie, it does look like we have a question from or comment from Yami. Okay, Yami. Hi, Bonnie. Uh, I was just, you know, been overhearing this presentation and loving it, reminded me of my times back at the local agency. And it's possible you mentioned this and I missed it, but uh, the part when you were talking about if um, participant gets a breast pump from their insurance and then the pump breaks, if they bring it to the office, we can replace it with a WIC pump. Uh, what happens if the participant gets a pump from us, you know, a WIC issued pump and that one breaks, and they bring it back. Could that be replaced? Or is it just one? I can't remember. Is it just one insurance, one time insurance only? No, that's a great question, Yami. Thank you for bringing it up. No, if we give a participant a pump and it's not working well, it's either broken um, or even a, you know, like a pump and style, that's previously what we were given and that wasn't working right. 
by all means, um, tell the participant that they can contact the local agency. Um, there's a couple different ways. If the pump and style isn't working, um, they are on warranty for a year. And so if it's within that first year, um, Medela will replace that pump. Usually the way we go about that is to have the participant bring the pump to the local agency and we give them a pump so that there's not any you know, time concerns with, with pumping. It's such a time critical thing. Um, and then we would contact Medela for a replacement for the, the pump that was broken. Um, it is possible for participants to do that directly with Medela themselves by calling the 1-800 number that's on the card that's in their pump. Um, and many times Medela will just overnight them after talking with them and finding out what the problem is, they'll overnight them a new pump directly without even involving WIC staff. So it, it's really important for uh, when you hand a, a pump to a person to have them fill out that card and send it back into Medela um, so that they then, you know, if there's anything that goes wrong with the pump, then they can get a replacement pump. So if that if they haven't done that and they don't know what to do and they're reaching out to you at the agency, um, we can step in and replace that pump. Um, we might want to do some troubleshooting first to make sure she's assembling it correctly and all of that. But um, if it's you know truly a broken pump, and we've had some pumps come in that dogs have chewed up, and um, you know, obviously they aren't going to be working correctly. The the cords have you know gotten broken um, or cut or it and it's a dangerous thing to plug in a cord like that there you know there's just things that happen so yes uh, if she's you know needing to continue breastfeeding we, we want to help her do that that's the bottom line to to support her so um, and most most agencies do have ample pumps available to be able to meet that need so thanks yami okay well we'll wrap this up we have a just a 10 minutes or so left before the end of um, this meeting. So we will go back and um, see if there are any other topics that you know local agencies, uh, you, you staff members would like to talk about. We'll go ahead and um, stop the recording.